Good morning. Wow, just like uh, fine wine, this event continues to improve year after year. Would you agree? It's yes. really a good event. Let's give, um, let's give SME and the TCT folks a, a round of applause for, for doing a... Uh, I mean, check out this room, the exhibit floor, the all of the social events and, and parties, and, and I could go on and on, and it's just uh, exceeded my expectations. And, and thank you, SME, for uh, inviting me back this year. I appreciate it very much. And thank, uh, thanks to all of you for, for being here this morning. I know some of you had late nights last night, and so it's, uh, it's good to see you here bright and early. So, a lot has happened in the, the last 25 years. This is my 25th year to participate in this event. And I thought back, you know, what has happened? And in some ways, a lot has changed, and in other ways, not a lot. And these are our two kids, by the way, Chad and Heather. Uh, this goes back to uh, just two months before Rapid Prototyping and Manufacturing 93, RPNM 93 conference and exposition. The first year that SME held this event with an exposition was in May of, uh, of 1993. And little Heather was feeding uh, Chad some Fruit Loops, and then uh, we mocked it up again. Well, it was, it was real uh, just recently. And so some things really don't change all that much. And I think you'll see that. Uh, you know, we're still using STL files, we're still building models, and we still are doing things like we did 25 years ago. But in other ways, things really have changed. Our daughter is now a certified PA. Our son is happy. We have a grandchild, which if you were here last year, you got to see her. Uh, well, it was my pleasure to, to share her with you. And, and then I wanted to say this, too. Uh, speaking of 25, I, I recall back in uh, 2006, it was probably late 2005, I received an invitation from SME to participate in this event. And of course, it's, I, I have trouble saying no anyway, but especially to be invited to attend this. And of course, I said yes. And I just quickly looked at my calendar. Of course, I can attend. I'd be, it'd be a, a, you know, a real privilege to be a part of this. And then <clears throat> as time went on, I looked at the calendar a little bit more closely. I go, whoa, this is May 23rd. May 23rd is our anniversary. I go, well, and then it occurred to me sometime after that, I'm a slow learner, that it was our 25th wedding anniversary. I go, oh man, what am I gonna do? And so then I, uh, I, I said to my wife, Diane, um, we should go someplace for our anniversary. <clears throat> and she said, she's thinking like Italy or, or Australia, someplace. Uh, and I said, I heard of this really cool place, it's called St. Charles. She said, is that in France? And I no, no, that's in uh, Chicago. Well, long story short, St. Charles was the location for the 2006 event. And so um, SME found out that it was our 25th wedding anniversary, and they just rolled out the red carpet, uh, made us feel like, ro like royalty. This is us in uh, a uh, Rolls Royce, sponsored by SME. Thank you very much. And we uh, really had a, a great time. So uh, the bride and I spent our 25th wedding anniversary at, uh, at this event. So it's been an adventure, <clears throat> a real adventure over the years. Um, you know, I, I have stories that could go on for hours, uh, some good, some bad, and some maybe even ugly. But we're, we're going to take a journey over the next about 40 minutes and talk about some of the what I see as the most uh, important developments and trends. We're going to look at uh, the popularity of, of metals and other materials as well, uh, some uh, production applications. Uh, and yes, I agree with the panel. We, we have really been fixated on, on production application. I think partly is because we've had nearly 30 years to figure out how to apply this technology to design models and prototype parts. The next frontier, the next big opportunity, and really where the money is in production is in production applications. And what's even more interesting in my view is to be able to use the same process for both production and for prototyping. So then you're not only prototyping the design, but you're also prototyping the process all the way through from start to finish. 
Design for additive manufacturing. We think it's so important that we designed a graphic, a logo, <laughs> on the subject. Absolutely vital. And we'll talk more about that, and you'll see that logo more. Uh, infrastructure investment, we're seeing a tremendous amount of money being spent in this area. And then where's it all headed? <clears throat> I don't know how many of you had a chance to visit this facility on Monday? Monday. Did the tour not go Monday? It didn't go? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, there was a, a tentative tour for this place. It's uh, just down the road from here. And a phenomenal facility, GE put it together around a $40 million investment. Uh, now it's part of the, uh, the GE additive. And in any case, uh, GE is, I think, an interesting model to look at as far as what they're doing in this area. And, and late last year, they announced GE additive, which will become another vertical like their other businesses. It's not officially yet, but it will become this over time. And so this company is uh, really all in when it comes to additive manufacturing. This group will all also serve the other groups in terms of machines and services, not necessarily as a, a service provider, but uh, to, to help support aviation and healthcare, oil and gas, and so forth. It uh, really came about with the investment of Arcam and Concept Laser uh, late last year in the, in the range of about $1.4 billion, unheard of in this industry. They claim, and we won't know for 10 years if this is true, but they claim that they are forecast that they will sell 10,000 industrial machines over the next 10 years and they expect to produce revenues in the range of $1 billion by 2020. And the last time I checked, that's only three years away. This was published in uh, the Wall Street Journal. It was, I think it was Friday. I think it was also in the print edition over the weekend. And, and what it shows is that just in a, a matter of uh, a very short time, GE, became the number two supplier of metal added to manufacturing machines behind EOS as the number one in terms of unit sales. And, uh, and they were kind enough to source us as the, the supplier of the information. Where did Robin go? Is he still here? Well, thank you for, for referring to it as a Bible. It's uh, a lowercase, but I appreciate that. Very, very generous of you to say this. Uh, not the Holy Bible, but uh, I do appreciate the, the kind words. So. <clears throat> so major corporations are getting into, into this in a way that we've not seen in the past. And that's very, very exciting. If you go around the world and look at some of the company, uh, countries rather uh, that are adopting this technology in, a, in an interesting way, you know, you can go down to the Southern Hem Hemisphere, Australia, even New Zealand, South Africa, Asia, many countries there, Europe, of course the U.S. Germany tends to stand out a bit because of not only the supplier companies, but also some of the user, the, the consumers of this technology. And these are among the brands in Germany that have made commitments to this technology, and some of them very, very big commitments. One of them stands out, and that's uh, Airbus. These are 30 new designs. And I talk about design for additive manufacturing. 30 new designs that they plan to be flying soon. Some are already in the air on the, the uh, A350, and a whole lot more are in the works. And that's exciting to see a company make a commitment at that level. If you look at uh, additive manufacturing system sales, it's grown by almost 500% in the last four years. Incredible growth. You look at, and this is just a sampling of some companies that are running metal AM machines. But you see the numbers, if you step back just five years, they may have one, two, maybe five machines. Now we're seeing companies running like 3T RPD in the UK, 13 machines, Linear, 17, FIT, a German company, 22 machines with seven large format uh, SLA 500s, which they might have among the largest capacity in the world. Uh, Arconic, and then a company that you may not have heard of, Bright Laser Technologies, they go by BLT. 
And they're running 42 machines. 30 of them are their own brand, their own machines that they developed, and then 12 EOS machines. And if you do the math, the, well, uh, we, we calculated the average selling price of these machines at around $566,000. So it's quite an investment, and that's just the machine. Then you have a whole lot of ancillary equipment and capability, as well as know-how to really support these machines. So these are big investments. This is interesting. I had a chance uh, a couple of weeks to take a really close look at it, and then, of course, this week as well. This is the uh, desktop metal machine uh, as an alternative to the powder bed uh, machines, which most of the parts being pr produced today are on uh, uh, powder bed fusion machines. And so this is a, a binder jet, jetting machine on the right. It's expected to be introduced in about a year's uh, time from now. And then the material extrusion machine on, this, on the left. Uh, I like the machine on the left, but the one on the right really got my attention, mainly due to its uh, speed and, and capacity. Uh, being able to produce about 8,200 cubic centimeters per hour, that is some serious volume. And so I'm looking forward to, to, seeing, that, uh, to seeing that roll out. And I think th there's a lot of innovation. The, the, the uh, microwave enhanced furnace is one. Uh, and and the, the support structures, the way those are removed. In fact, I, I processed one early this morning, uh, right after my first cup of coffee, and it really is uh, as simple as tapping it on a tabletop. Now, not all parts are going to fall away that easily. It depends on how they're designed. But the removal of supports, uh, removal of the parts off of a build plate uh, with powder bed fusion, I mean, they're welded, literally welded to the build plate. So you have to remove that somehow. And then removing the support structures and sometimes called anchors from the parts can take hours, even days, and it can leave scarring. In some cases, it's almost impossible, depending upon the design. So I think there's still some challenges and you know, development here. But uh, what I've seen thus far, I'm encouraged in, in uh, the way I look at it as a customer, as a user, I'm, you know, competition is good. And if this is more competition and it reduces the, the cost and, and improves the speed, then that's good. I wanted to mention, too, that I was impressed by the talent that uh, Rick uh, Falloup has put together, these 100 engineers, uh, 14 PhDs, and, and uh, four MIT professors that he's brought together. Uh, one including uh, Eli, uh, Eli Sa uh, Ellie Sachs, rather, who was the inventor of binder jetting at MIT, was then later licensed to, to Z Corp, uh, Therax, Sologen, Specific Surface, uh, then Extrude Home, and now uh, X1. And so he's a part of this, and I had a chance to talk with him. He was there hard at work uh, a couple of weeks ago. So this is, uh, this is something to, to look at if you haven't yet. And uh, like I said, I, the, the jury's still out in turn. until customers provide feedback. That's when you know, they confirm what we see. And so uh, I'm looking forward to these systems rolling out. So while we spend a whole lot of time and thought on metals, it still represents only about 14% of the material sales in this industry. So about 85% is still polymers. So that's where the money is currently. Yeah, a lot is uh, going into metals, but uh, filaments, powders, and, and uh, liquids in the form of uh, photopolymers represent quite a lot. This is a case I, I want to share with you. And I thought it was interesting because as much as we, uh, well, it really has, there's two sub-stories here. What this is is a universal controller. You know, think of UAVs and things that go in the air and the land, the sea. And, and so the uh, Department of Defense military contacted uh, Dynetics, which is an engineering company, to work on this project. And it turned out that um, they contacted JBIL which is one of the world's largest contract manufacturers in the world. Uh, they have uh, more than 100 manufacturing facilities, 180,000 employees. Uh, that company, by the way, one year ago had five people dedicated to 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Today, they have 35 people working on it and growing. Uh, they're, they're, they're another company that's just uh, really taking this very seriously. In any case, uh, Dynetics went to, to J-Bell for the, uh, the, the manufacturing. Uh, J-Bell looked at it, and the tooling for these parts was going to exceed $300,000. Plus, the military wanted some flexibility in terms of making variations of this. So it would be 
thousand times the number of changes they would if they wanted uh, different variations of it. So they looked at, is there another way we can manufacture these uh, polymer parts? They looked, uh, they've been using the HP uh, jet fusion technology for some time, so they did some cost analysis and testing, and they calculated the break even for the largest part that you see here is at 5,000 units. So what that means is that they can, if you, if you produce up to 5,000 units, it's less expensive to, to, to grow, to print the parts versus to, to produce a mold and, and then manufacture them. Of course, then you also have flexibility uh, in you know, mixing, matching, doing whatever quantities you want up to that amount. The smallest part that you see in the lower left, uh, uh, the break-even point is 25,000 units, and that's today. The, the material is still relatively expensive, but that with competition, it'll, I expect it will decline. So, uh, so that's interesting to see. Uh, and, and what's more, this is uh, without redesign. This is, these designs uh, did not change. And so through redesign, you can even get more economy of scale through things like part consolidation and using uh, less material. So, so that's an encouraging. In fact, j -Bell will argue that if you have to redesign everything, that's going to be a big uh, impediment to growth and adoption of this industry. It just can't happen. So I think, I think you know, I agree with them in the short term that that's, that's true. In the long term, though, if you have a company that doesn't redesign and, and gets to where these guys are going with this project, but then you have another company that does redesign, who's going to be more competitive? So I think uh, in the end, uh, redesigning the parts for additive manufacturing through things like topology optimization and other uh, light weighting type of uh, uh, approaches, and particularly part consolidation, uh, such as what GE, Airbus, and many other companies are doing is you know, taking a lot of parts that before each have part numbers and inventory, assembly, labor, and so forth, bringing those together digitally and then printing them uh, can uh, just have enormous uh, advantages. We're seeing, and we have for some time, uh, very niche type applications in the consumer space. And so here's a, a UK bicycle, it's called Robot Bike Company, and you can see these uh, uh, lugs that they're producing, and then you, they're using standard carbon fiber tubes to connect them, but they're using things like topology optimization, which is really letting mathematics decide where to put the material to reduce the, um, uh, to, to optimize the strength to weight ratio. That's really what is a fancy term to just, you know, let mathematics decide to do it, put it to work. And it's really a stepping stone to uh, generative type of, of approaches where you really turn over a problem to the computer and let the computer figure out the design rather than you having to figure it out on your own. And that's where we're going in the future. And we're seeing things like the faucets where the water runs up through these little tubes and the eyewear uh, from companies such as uh, Hoot Eyewear and many other eyewear companies too now are producing, are in manufacturing in some quantity. And, and then this is, uh, this is an interesting one because, you know, Nike, Under Armour, um, who am I missing? There's a, most of the major footwear companies have done some demonstrations and some quantity of manufacturing. Uh, Adidas announced that they will use a carbon process to manufacture 100,000 pairs of shoes next, uh, next year. So that's been the biggest announcement to date. And so, but it, like I said, it's still a very much a, a niche type of an area. There, 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 there are riches in niches, but uh, I, I think a lot needs to happen in terms of speed and cost reduction before we're going to see um, a lot of these types of products uh, manufactured in this way. You know, the automotive industry is, uh, has been one of the early adopters. You know, it goes way back to the late 80s and early 90s for, for models and prototype parts for actual, man and some tooling as well. For actual production, it just doesn't make economic sense in most cases. Now, if you're talking about cars like this, anybody in here have one of these cars? Ah, oh, this guy does, what do you have? No, none of the above. Oh, none of the above, oh. You'd like to have one, yeah. Well, I don't either, so. But, but most of these cars are in quantities of, of five to, to 10,000 uh, units. And so this is a case where you can justify the use of additive manufacturing for that kind of quantity. Uh, if you're talking about you know, Ford GM, Chrysler, Toyota, uh, 3 Series, BMW, that sort of thing, it's just the, the, the quantities are just too high. However, we're getting there. The motorsports industry has been using it for a long time. 
These types of companies are beginning to use it and some have for some time. But it's just a matter of time when we have both the polymer like HP, as an example, and the metals like desktop metal, if, if they get there, as an example, then I think we have a foundation, or at least part of the ingredients, to get to manufacturing quantities for the, the Fords, GMs, and Chryslers of the world. This is an interesting project where this company, Divergent 3D, uh, raised $23 million to bring this to market, this uh, ch re uh, chassis redesign. You can see some of the, the mesh structures and topology optimization. And, and there again, they're using these carbon fiber tubes to connect uh, the parts. And so I think it's this kind of innovation that the automotive industry, they, they re really need to rethink the design from the ground up. And, and so this, uh, this is, is interesting in my view. Daimler is currently using, or plans to use, added manufacturing for uh, spare parts of their trucks. So a lot of big trucks you know, can be in low, much lower vo volume than, uh, than automobile uh, the cars. Uh, Honda has announced that they're using it for their electric cars. Audi has announced a new uh, added manufacturing center that they're building. Uh, Renault Trucks also is getting into it, and many other car companies are looking at it. Uh, I've had discussions over the years, but it's uh, largely about timing and, of course, cost. When does it make sense to really, uh, and it's not that easy because if you just take the, uh, an existing design and, and do a cost analysis, it probably won't make sense anytime soon. But it, by redesign and doing things differently, it could make sense uh, very soon. So design for additive manufacturing. Here's a couple of metal parts. Uh, the one on the left uh, is up on a satellite. Uh, this part on, in the middle there, uh, that has flown on aircraft uh, by Airbus. Uh, but it's not only metals, it's also polymers, as you see here. And, and thankfully, we, we have tools now, and they're not finished. I mean, there's these, they need more work. I'm not, with all due respect to the developers, I mean, they, you got to start somewhere, right? But they're getting better and better. But these companies, uh, also companies such as 3D Sim and, and uh, uh, MS, uh, MSC and, and others are developing tools for things like, uh, you know, distortion type problems, uh, support structure op optimization. You got to have supports to anchor the parts down to the build plate. Otherwise, they start to warp out of shape. Uh, if you have too many supports, that means more material and, and more work removing them after the build. So you want to optimize those, and, and, and that's not easy just by trial and error. How many times do you want to build that part until you optimize it? Uh, and that's what companies are doing now. They may build it three, five, maybe even ten times, and the builds can take 40, 50 hours, depending upon the size of the part. So you can see that it can take weeks to optimize by trial and error. And so these tools will help reduce that, uh, that optimization. And, and companies like Siemens and, and Deso uh, are also uh, offering tools today uh, to, uh, to help with uh, this design for additive manufacturing. This is something that I showed last year, but we've updated it. And I just wanted to point out and, and I guess underscore the, the panelists, uh, I think, what was it, Graham, that uh, you said something about post-processing. And, and, and you know, it's, I think there, if there's two areas that need work, it's one is the design, design tools, and another is this right here. You can, you can have great designs, you can have a fast machine, but if you have to spend a lot of time post-processing these parts, especially manual labor, it'll just kill you. You won't be able to make a business case. So we're gonna have to find ways to streamline, and it's often on a case-by-case -case basis in order to do that. Uh, Align Technology, the makers of the Invisal Invisalign uh, dental aligners, is a good case. Go on the web, you can see a video. All the automation they have surrounding their 3D printing, and, and, and it serves as an example of what other companies will need to do if they really want to optimize the start to finish process. So pro post processing and material handling, uh, all of these things, finishing parts, will need to be automated through uh, uh, various means and maybe even some, some invention to get there. Metal powder bed fusion is definitely the most, uh, most popular process for building metal parts today. Did you know that 15 companies, brands of these machines are now in Asia? 15, 11 in Europe and only two in the United States. And the two in the United States 
3D systems came from the acquisition, acquisitions of uh, companies in Belgium, in France, and then uh, G with uh, acquisitions from Germany and Sweden. So even while you know, the United States was really the early innovators and a lot of invention came from here and arguably still has the most experience and in installations in this country, uh, look at the picture today. Quite different than uh, 15 years ago. Very, very different. Uh, associate consultant uh, Joseph Cowan, I think you're in the room, so I know you're here this week. But in any case, he pointed this out to me last week. He said, look at these car companies in China. I mean, how many of you he have heard of uh, Great Wall Motors or Brilliance Auto? You have? I had not. I mean, I haven't heard of most of these brands, yet they're selling you know, more than 24 million cars a year from these brands in China. And the point here is that while most of us haven't heard of these brands, they're doing a lot of volume and a lot of business. And the same is true with their uh, additive manufacturing machines. There's a lot of companies that are getting funding from various sources, the local province and central government levels and other means as well to fund companies. So part of those 15 companies, some of those are in Asia and there's a lot of other plastic powder bed fusion companies too, and other types of uh, FDM type clones, FDM coming of course from uh, Stratasys, uh, the, the technology. And, and so just keep that in mind as well. We may not know about or have heard of these companies, there is a lot going on in China, more than uh, most of us know. And so it's uh, important to, to note. This is one company you may have heard of. Trump Precision Technology has been around for a long time. They've been doing uh, laser centering machines. And sometime in the recent past, Stratus has uh, invested in them and then uh, more recently formed a company called TPM 3D. And they are selling products today. And I was told by a source uh, in China that uh, the company will be introducing uh, a new product soon. He says it's going to be a big surprise, so we'll have to uh, anticipate that. I see Scott Crump here in the front, the uh, inventor of FDM and founder of. Uh, of uh, Stratus uh, here, and so uh, maybe you can uh, shed some insight onto, uh, into what they're gonna be doing here. So, But in any case, um, that's something to look forward to. That's one of the Chinese companies. And, and so then <clears throat> you look at uh, the investments that we're seeing now, and this is, just some, th this is just a sampling of since one year ago that we've co collected, and you know, some are pretty big, carbon, $220 million. Uh, desktop metal, $100 million, G, $110 million, and I think that's only a part of their investment. And then last year at this time, I showed these investments. And, and honestly, we don't know about all of them because we know about, well, we, we do have some insight into a, a number of brands in Europe and elsewhere where we've had a chance to work with them internally. And Many companies and some of the biggest brands in the world have developed groups and they're working on this in a big way and already spent millions of dollars. And we don't know how many, but there could be tens, maybe even hundreds of those activities. I mean, how many one to five billion dollar companies are here in the United States alone? A lot. And some of those companies are working on it too. So uh, no one knows, to the best of my knowledge, <laughs> all of these investments, but it could be hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in the development and, and trying to understand, wrap their head around, how do we enter this market? Where We don't want to be left out. We don't want to be the Nokia of the world where uh, Nokia is sitting and then all of a sudden they, you know, they own the market. Or Palm. You remember Palm? I was a big Palm user and then all of a sudden uh, you know, the iPhone comes out. And so you know, they, they want to be there when, when the time is right. So a lot of companies are looking at this and trying to, trying to wrap their heads around and trying to figure out how they can participate, how they can contribute and, and add value. I wanted to talk a little bit about castings too. You know, it, it makes sense while direct metal is, is, is good and important, there comes a point when the size, because they are relatively slow, when you, when you scale up in size, it just doesn't make sense. It takes too long, it's way too expensive. So there are other ways to get there. One is sand casting through X1, or in this case, voxel jet. I visited this company in, um, Oh geez, where was it? Uh, south of, of uh, Johannesburg. This is about uh, nine months ago or, or less. It's in November, and this particular company—they're building these big industrial compressors, and they're doing—they're building these castings 
printing voxajet molds and cores and then pouring molten metal in them and, and casting them. And what that's enabled them to do, it's a fairly small company, it's for the mining industry, they're saving $147,000 per casting. And this is at a very poor exchange rate. Uh, be, it would be more, more like $250,000. That much money in eight to 11 months per casting having a tremendous impact on their business, absolutely stunning them out. And then sand casting, we've seen that for a long time. We have some, our, I mean, uh, investment casting, and we have some uh, investment uh, casting experts in here, people like Tom Mueller and, and others. Uh, tooling, you know, a lot has been tried over the years and a lot of failures, but I think at some point, and in some cases, they're again on a case-by-case -case basis, it can make sense to, to print your molds, dyes, or whatever types of tools, uh, things like what you see here, uh, jigs, fixtures, drill guides, cutting guides, uh, things for testing, for, for manufacturing. And, and so these things are happening often behind the scenes, but are very, very important applications for this technology that often gets overlooked because we're so fixed on, on building parts direct, which is, uh, of course, also important, but so, uh, so are these applications. <clears throat> Composite materials. Uh, I, I think that Mark Forge has done a fabulous job with uh, what they've rolled out thus far, and I, I believe they're here. They're in the upper left, and you know, being able to do continuous fiber of uh, carbon, Kevlar, and, and fiberglass is quite uh, interesting. A year ago, Envision Tech uh, uh, made an announcement. Uh, here you see the uh, the Cincinnati machine that Oak Ridge National Laboratory helped with. And, and then most recently, and congratulations to uh, Impossible Objects and to uh, Desktop Metal for uh, receiving the awards. But uh, yeah, if you haven't looked at Impossible Objects, I had a chance to look at it, I, I want to say it was two years ago, maybe it was maybe two and a half years ago. And of course, it wasn't developed and automated, it was just very conceptual. I just scratched my head thinking, oh, no way, you know, this is just too, too many steps, but they've done it. I mean, they're building parts and they look pretty good. So uh, my hat's off to, to these uh, companies that are building composite parts because, as you know, you can really produce some very strong, stiff uh, parts in this way. Printed electronics, uh, quite interesting. The, the one on the lower right is from HP. They were here showing this for the, one of the first times, this printed uh, uh, strain gauge inside a part and being able to uh, send a signal from that to a computer and then putting a load on it and showing the numbers real time. And it, was that cool or what? I don't know if you saw that, but very, very interesting work uh, being able to do that. Uh, printed uh, antennas in the upper right. Millions, millions of mobile phones now have been printed. Well, the antennas have been printed in the frame of the mobile phone uh, to, to reduce cost and pr improve performance. This uh, turbine blade, this is for uh, a GE power systems down in uh, South Carolina. This is now in production. So this is a printed turbine blade and they're printing uh, creep sensors so that they can over time check to see through fatigue if there's problem areas. And so they measure these little, and I'll do a little zoom here. Uh, that's what the, and, and they have this here by the way. So if you go to the Optimec uh, booth, uh, their exhibit, you can see this. And I think this is a great example. They're, they're printing a ceramic ink and it can withstand up to almost a thousand degrees C. And so this is a great example of putting this technology to work uh, that can, can really add value and be able to look at uh, parts before they fail. Uh, in the past, if one of the bl blades fail, they have to remove them all. Now they can look at each blade individually and take one out of service and replace it. Hybrid systems, uh, interesting. You know, for a very long time, some of us have thought this, this would be ideal if you can just really optimize the additive and the cutting, you know, because there's, you know, benefit from the best of both worlds, because there are benefits to additive manufacturing and milling, grinding and so forth. And, and so companies, of course, uh, you know about many of them, I'm sure, but, but companies are putting them to work. I think the, the niche here, the real natural application here is for, uh, for adding features, for repair of turbine blades, uh, worn parts where you add material and machine. Uh, does it make sense to, to use them to, to build parts from scratch? Maybe. 
Maybe, but there's a lot of problems that need to be solved with that. It's all about software. I mean, the hardware, the technology, tool changes, all that's been in place for a long time. But you know, how do you do that to optimize the, the adding, the, I mean, a lot of heat and distortion, a lot of things going on. So, but I think in the shorter term, uh, where it's at here is uh, the repair business. Medical. Wow, just so much going on. We could have an entire week of, well, there are conferences, entire weeks of conferences just on this, uh, this subject alone. And it's just so exciting to see the healthcare industry uh, embrace this technology as it has. And not only the, the smaller companies and the technology people, but the, the, the medical professionals, the hospitals, the, the FDA. And, 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 and so, <clears throat> I mean, there's a story behind all these, and, and time is short here, but I just wanted to, 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 to do this. Late, fairly late last night, I uh, heard from Andy Christensen, who's been in this business and arguably the, the expert on, on the subject. I think Andy's in here somewhere. And he sent these slides to me, or, or uh, this is a version. In any case, he, he attends this, uh, this Radiologic uh, Society of North America event every year. I think it was in Chicago this past December. And they are launching, this organization, a special interest group on 3D printing. That's how important it is to this group. And according to Andy, he said that uh, there's some really interesting developments over the past year that the year before weren't as visible. One is the, the point of care manufacturing by hospitals is really something that's hot and people are talking about and trying to understand and figure out. And, you know, for example, to, to bring in, like at uh, a pediatric hospital, bring in machines and expertise and, and develop models on site to, to assist their physicians and medical teams in, in complex surgeries. Uh, this group, as I mentioned, formed this uh, uh, special interest group and is working with SME, the SME Medical AM Work Group, of which I think Laura Lynn McDaniel, does she head up? Laura Lynn, are you in here? Laura Lynn was largely responsible for getting that uh, Rolls-Royce set up, so I, I, I appreciate that. And, and so they're working together. Uh, DICOM is, is kind of like the PDF of the medical imaging world. It's uh, the standard way of communicating digital imagery from CT, MRI type scan data into uh, applications. And they have a work group going on and focused on how do we ensure that the data is a good carrier of not only the imaging data, but also data that needs to uh, support 3D printing. And so that's important work. And then the FDA continues to clear, and I don't know, a couple of years ago, it was in the 20s, uh, different designs had been, uh, had received clearance, FDA clearance for use, a lot of spinal, knees, uh, different types of body parts, mostly metal implants. So, but uh, according to, to Andy, they continue to, to clear uh, implants. So the, the, the world of, of 3D printing and additive manufacturing, you know, terms that we use interchangeably, and I think most of you do too, they really mean the same thing, uh, really is pretty tiny. It's a pretty small industry. It's only about 6.1 billion if you round up last year. Now, th this does not take into account some of those investments that I talked about, a lot of the R&D at these companies, we don't add this in. This, this is on products and services, products being machines, materials, aftermarket products, services being mostly service providers, uh, maintenance agreements, that sort of thing. And so if you look at, well, what percentage of market penetration has this industry uh, made on the global manufacturing economy? Well, if you believe that it's around 12.8 trillion, 8.8, uh, 12.8 uh, trillion dollars, this 6.1 represents not 1%, not 0.1%, but a half of 0.1%. That's how small this industry is and how much opportunity we have uh, in the world of manufacturing. Growth has been strong. It cooled a little bit last year, but still 28% compounded annually for the past four years. 350% growth over that period of time, not bad. So if you look at from 2007 to 2016, that part that I've highlighted in light blue, and then remap it to a different scale, the scale here being from zero to seven billion, and then go from zero to 30 billion, now you've got from 2007 to 2016, this is where we believe we're going. And we think this is a conservative estimate. You know, considering some of these 
developments that are going on, we could be way low. But we, we do think that it'll hit $26 billion in a, a few years. It's not that far out. And in the future, we believe that it will penetrate at least 5% of that global manufacturing economy, which would be a $650 billion industry. Okay, so I haven't talked really much at all about the, the low-cost desktop machines. Not that they aren't important, they are. Most of which are really, I'll call them clones of FDM from, uh, from, from Stratasys. Uh, very important, in fact, Companies now are buying them in big numbers for installation into their companies. That before they might spend ten, twenty, even fifty thousand dollars on a machine, now are spending average selling price of around a thousand dollars for a machine for conceptual modeling, prototyping, that kind of thing. Really early design work, and so they're playing a really critical role. It's interesting to see some of these developments where, like with Stratasys announced, uh, this continuous where you've got a bunch of machines working in harmony with these fairly low cost machines and, and turning out parts on a continuous basis. And, uh, and, and some other companies have experimented with that in the past. And, and so it's a, they absolutely play a role. Uh, some people call them consumer printers. I cringe at that. In fact, I had a, an interesting conversation with the CEO of one of the, the major companies in this business yesterday. He said 60% of his, of his machines are going to companies, 30% to educational institutions, and then 10% are to the hobbyists, the uh, makers, do-it-yourselfers, uh, the geeks like me, and so forth. And so really, uh, these are uh, serious machines down there getting better and better and better. They really are. Okay, what we do know that in the future, and this is really about the future, that the change in volumes and production ones will be radically different than what we've seen before. Instead of producing uh, you know, millions of something, now we can break that up into smaller, smaller uh, parts and, and produce them in, in smaller numbers, and we'll have more variety. So maybe your product family might, might be 15 or 50 different uh, types of, of product instead of maybe three or five. And it'll give you a chance to, to print things and get it out there to see if there's an appetite for these products. And so companies uh, will do that more in the future. And in open systems, too, I couldn't agree more with Stephen Nigro on Monday when he was talking about open systems and standards. We, we have a lot to do in that, that area, but we're moving in that direction. As patents expire and companies use open systems, open materials, standards, and so forth, uh, that's good for, for customers. Uh, Greg Morris mentioned supply chain simplification. Absolutely. When you, when you reduce part counts from 850 parts down to uh, a couple dozen parts, what, do, what impact does that have on your supp supply chain? It can be drastic. And so we're going to see uh, a lot of change there. Uh, companies are trying to wrap their heads around that. Uh, and, and speed. Speed. Now, this uh, Sunday evening had, uh, had, had some time with uh, the people from Jabil. And in Russia, LaSalle was talking and convinced me, well, we were in agreement, but you know, what, what does speed mean? Is it speed to, to market? Is, is it speed in the pre-processing, the machine time, the delivery, uh, you know, working with the supply chain? But just speed in general is gonna be so important in the future. And so if you're not fast, you probably won't survive. And then what we don't know, you know, we, we, there's a lot of things that we see and that we hear about, we read about, don't believe everything you read because, uh, uh, you know, just uh, validate everything you hear and read uh, because sometimes things uh, are not as they appear. But, you know, I mean, you can use uh, uh, ultrasound data to, to produce products. You can, uh, this is a very recent design on the right, a desktop still that you can 3D print. Is there a market for that? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, some people want one of everything, right? I mean, after a few years, like, what can I give Diane for her birthday for Christmas for, uh, so I'll give her a still, right? Uh, she may not appreciate that. But the, 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 the point is that we don't know, because now we can do it so inexpensively, most people wouldn't develop a desktop still and, and, and put it out there because it'd just be too expensive, because most people wouldn't I, you don't know if there's a market for it, but now you can. You put it out there and see if there's a market. So, so I want one of these, and so I guess uh, Olaf, uh, associate consultant Olaf uh, Deagle, who's a brilliant consultant and a, a designer, designed for additive manufacturing, has done this work. The, the one in the, the lower middle is, um, 
you take the, your loved one that is no longer with us and, and uh, you scan her before she's uh, no longer with us and then this is the, uh, the, uh, the urn and so her ashes are inside. I don't know, They're, that's kind of a crazy thing but what's even crazier is this. So Ann Lindeboom was born in 1920. She lived for a number of years. She died in 1984 and, and they took her ashes and she's now a toaster. Now, maybe, maybe there's not a market for, for this, but the point is we don't know all the different applications. I mean, can you, really, do you want grandma to be a toaster? I don't know. <laughs> but we don't know. I mean, what's exciting is what we do know, but what's even more exciting is what we don't know about ways in which we can apply this technology and the new markets and, and businesses that will develop as a result. So that's, exam uh, that, that's, that's very exciting. I just uh, wanted to make a shout out to uh, three organizations for, I think, having uh, a real impact, especially the first two in the long term. Or, well, the longest term, of course, SME had been around for, what, 80 some years? Very long time, and, and this, uh, this event depends on how you add it up, 27 years. I count it 25 because of, but uh, we won't, we've had some friendly debates about that, but, but for a very long time. And I think without events like this, we wouldn't be as far as we are. And it's great to see the uh, Rapid News Communications people with a, the very strong TCT brand be a part of this. So it, it's great, uh, there's strength in numbers. America Makes, you know, this technology really got its traction. I think it was a tipping point in the third quarter of 2012. And there are a number of reasons. I can count seven. We don't have time to count seven here. But uh, do we have six minutes left or are we over six minutes? Okay. Uh, America Makes, I think, uh, is having a great impact and has inspired unanticipated un, uh, uh, consequences where now there's uh, national programs around the world uh, uh, similar in some ways to America Make. So I, I really applaud what they're doing. And then quickly, 3D veterans. Training military veterans to use 3D printing. And, and these people have gotten together with lots of volunteer, volunteers uh, support from Google and Autodesk and others and are training people. They had their first session in September of last year in San Antonio. I had a chance to visit and talk with them. Out of the 13, 10 of the 13 are now working in 3D printing. Is that cool or what? That is great. So. And they have more planned, one here, one in L.A. and another place. So, it's, uh, it, so if you hear about this, want to support this group, uh, I'm sure you can Google and find out, uh, learn more about them. So with that, just thank you very much for your attention, and, and thanks for, uh, again for being here.